Before getting into part two of our series, I need to make a correction to something I said in part one, as well as to add a clarification to something else said there. Two things. The first is a little embarrassing. One of the commenters kindly informed me that my claim that woman in English is derived from two words, womb and man, signifying a man with a womb, was wrong. Now, as a member of the governing body, I've asked the local elders to take that troublemaker into the back room of the Kingdom Hall and make him recant. And if he doesn't, they need to disfellowship the apostate. What's that? I'm not a member of the governing body? I can't do that? Oh, well, I guess I'll have to admit I made a mistake. Seriously, this illustrates the danger that we all face, as this was something I learned a long time ago, learned being in quotes, and never thought to question. We have to question every premise, but it is often difficult to distinguish between hard facts and an untested premise especially if the premise goes way back to childhood, because our brain has by now integrated it into our mental library of established fact. Now, the other thing I wanted to bring up was the fact that when one looks up Genesis 2.18 in the interlinear, it doesn't say complement. This was brought to my attention by someone else. Well, I knew it, but I never thought it was an issue. It seems to be for the mind of some. Therefore, the New World Translation renders this, I am going to make a helper for him as a complement of him. The two words often translated suitable helper in other versions are the Hebrew words neged ezer. I stated that I like the rendering of the New World Translation over most other versions because I believed it was closer to the meaning of the original. Okay, I know that a lot of people don't like the New World Translation, particularly those who favor belief in the Trinity. But come on, it is not all bad. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, okay? Why do I think that Neged should be translated complement or counterpart instead of suitable? Well, here's what Strong's Concordance has to say. Neged, definition in front of, in sight of, opposite to. Now notice how rarely it is translated suitable in the New American Standard Bible, compared with other terms like before and front and opposite. I'll leave this on the screen for a moment so you can review the list. You might want to pause the video while you take this in. Of particular relevance, is this quote taken from Strong's Exhaustive Concordance? From Nagad, a front, i.e. part opposite, specifically a counterpart or mate. So even though the organization diminishes the role of women in God's arrangement, their own translation of the Bible does not lend support to their view of women as subservient. Much of their view is the result of the aberration in the relationship between the sexes caused by the original sin, the man and woman of Genesis 3.16. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That's from the New International Version. Sin threw us out of balance. Men became dominators, women more subservient. Only God can restore balance to the male-female relationship. But we don't have to wait for the kingdom to come to do that. As Christians, we are become the children of God. Therefore, we will not allow sinful tendencies to serve as an excuse to taint our relationship with the opposite sex. Our goal is is to restore the balance that the first pair lost by rejecting their Heavenly Father. To accomplish this, we have but to follow the pattern of the Christ. With that goal in view, let us examine the various roles that Jehovah assigned to women in Bible times. I come from a Jehovah's Witnesses background, and so I will contrast these biblical roles 
with those which are practiced in my former faith, though their example is hardly unique within historical Christendom. Jehovah's Witnesses do not allow women, one, to pray on behalf of the congregation, two, to teach and instruct the congregation as men do, three, to hold positions of oversight within the congregation. At this stage, I think it will be advantageous to lay out the topics we will cover in the rest of this series. Starting with this video, we are going to start to answer these questions by examining the roles Jehovah God himself has assigned to women. Obviously, if our Heavenly Father calls upon a woman to fill a role, which we might feel only a man can fill, we need to readjust our thinking. In the next video, we will apply that knowledge to the Christian congregation to understand the proper roles for both men and women and examine the whole issue of authority within the Christian congregation. In the fourth video, we will examine problematic passages from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, as well as to Timothy, that seem to severely restrict the role of women within the congregation. In subsequent videos, we'll examine the headship principle, the issue of head coverings, how prayer, teaching, and oversight are to be applied within the congregation, and the proper exercise of headship within the marital arrangement. For now, let us start with the last of our three points. Should Jehovah's Witnesses, as well as other denominations in Christendom, allow women to hold positions of oversight? Obviously, the proper exercise of oversight requires both wisdom and discernment. One has to decide which course of action to follow if one is to oversee others. That requires good judgment, does it not? Likewise, if an overseer is called upon to resolve a dispute, to arbitrate between who is right and who is wrong, he is acting as a judge, is he not? Would Jehovah allow women to act as judges over men? Speaking for Jehovah's Witnesses, the answer would be a resounding no. When the Australia Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse recommended to witness leadership that they include women at some level of the judicial process, the governing body's response was utterly intransigent. Under no circumstances would they make women any part of the judicial process. They believed that to include women at any stage would be to violate God's law and the Christian arrangement. But is their view really God's view? If you are familiar with the Bible, you are probably aware that there is a book called Judges. This is the account of about 300 years in the history of Israel when there was no king, but rather there were individuals who acted as judges to resolve disputes. However, they did more than just judge. You see, the Israelites were not a particularly faithful lot. They would not keep Jehovah's law. They would sin against him by worshiping false gods. When they did that, Jehovah withdrew his protection and inevitably some other nation would come in as marauders, conquer them, and enslave them. They would then cry out in their anguish, and God would raise up a judge to save them, rescuing them out of the hand of their oppressors. So the judges also acted as saviors of the nation. Judges 2.16 reads, So Jehovah would raise up judges, and they would save them out of the hand of their pillagers. The Hebrew word for judge is shafat, and according to Brown Driver Briggs means, one, act as lawgiver, judge, governor, giving law, deciding controversies, and executing law, civil, religious, political, social, both early and late. Two, specifically decide controversy, discriminate between persons in civil, political, domestic, and religious questions. Three, execute judgment. There was no higher position of authority in Israel at that time, which was before the time of the kings. Having learned its lesson, the liberated generation of Israel, Israelites would usually remain faithful, but when they died out, a new generation would replace them and the cycle would repeat, confirming the old adage, those who will not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. What does this have to do with the role of women? Well, we've already established that many Christian religions, including Jehovah's Witnesses, will not accept a woman as a judge. Now, here is where it gets interesting. The book, Insight on the Scriptures, Volume 2, page 134, 
published by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, lists 12 men who served as judges and saviors to the nation of Israel during the approximately 300 years covered by the Bible book of Judges. Here's the list. Here's the problem. One of them was never a judge. Do you know which one? Number seven, Barak. His name appears 13 times in the book of Judges, but never once is he called a judge, nor portrayed in the act of judging Israel. The term Judge Barak occurs 47 times in the Watchtower magazine and nine times in the inside volumes, but never once in the Bible. Never once. During his lifetime, who judged Israel, if not Barak? The answer comes from the Bible. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidith, was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under Deborah's palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in the mountainous region of Ephraim. The Israelites would go up to her for judgment. Judges 4, 4, and 5, New World Translation. Deborah was a prophet of God, and she also judged Israel. Wouldn't that make her a judge? Wouldn't we be right to call her Judge Deborah? Surely, since that is right there in the Bible, we should have no problem calling her a judge, right? What does the Inside Book have to say about that? When the Bible first introduces Deborah, it refers to her as a prophetess. The designation makes Deborah unusual in the Bible record, but hardly unique. Deborah had another responsibility. She was also evidently settling disputes by giving Jehovah's answer to problems that came up. Judges 4, 4, and 5, and said on the Scriptures, Volume 1, page 743. The inside book says that she was evidently settling disputes. Evidently. That makes it sound like we are inferring something not explicitly stated. Their own translation says she was judging Israel and that these lights would go up to her for judgment. There is no evidently about it. It is clearly and explicitly stated that she was judging the nation. That makes her a judge. The supreme judge of that time, in fact. So why don't the publications call her Judge Deborah? Why do they confer that title on Barak, who is never depicted as acting in any role as judge? In fact, he is depicted in a subservient role to Deborah. Yes, a man was in a subservient role to a woman, and this was by the hand of God. Let me lay out the scenario. At that time, the Israelites were suffering under the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan. They wanted to be free. God raised up Deborah. And she told Barak what had to be done. I'm reading from the New World Translation from Judges 4, 6 to 9. She sent for Barak. He didn't send for her. She summoned him and he came and said to him, Has not Jehovah the God of Israel given the command, Go and march to Mount Tabor and take 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun with you. I will bring to you Sisera the chief of Jabin's army, along with his war chariots and his troops to the stream of Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Who is planning military strategy here? Not Barak. Jehovah could have given him instructions directly, but instead God has him taking his orders from his prophet Deborah. At this Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I will not go. Barak was no coward, but he knew who God was using and blessing, and he wanted that blessing to accompany him on his campaign. To this she said, I will certainly go with you. However, the campaign you are going on will not bring you glory, for it will be into the hand of a woman that Jehovah will give Sisera. Further to this, Jehovah reinforces the role of women by telling Barak that he will not kill the chief of the enemy army, Sisera, but that this enemy of Israel will die at the hand of a mere woman. In fact, it was a woman named Jael who killed Sisera. Why would the organization alter the Bible account and ignore God's appointed prophet, judge, and savior by replacing her with a man? In my opinion, they do this because the man of Genesis 3.16 is very much in dominance within the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. They cannot countenance the idea of a woman in charge of men. They cannot accept that a woman would be placed in a position in which she would be able to judge and command men. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. Clearly, 
facts do not matter when they conflict with the interpretation of men. To be fair, the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses is hardly unique in their misogynistic position. The fact is that the man of Genesis 3.16 is alive and well in many Christian denominations. And let's not even talk about the other non-Christian religions of the earth, many of which hold women in virtual slavery. Let's move forward now to the Christian era. Things have changed for the better because God's servants are no longer under the law of Moses, but under the superlative law of Christ. Are Christian women allowed any judgment within the congregation, or was Deborah an aberration? Under the Christian arrangement, there is no religious government, no king other than Jesus himself. There is no provision for a pope ruling over all, nor for an archbishop of the Church of England, nor for a president of the uh, Church of, of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, nor for a governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. So how is judging supposed to be handled within the Christian arrangement? When it comes to handling judicial matters in the Christian congregation, the only command from Jesus is that found at Matthew 18, 15 to 17. We discussed this in detail in a previous video, and I'll post a link to it above should you want to review that information. The passage starts out by saying, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. That's from the New International Version. The New Living Translation renders it as, If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. The reason I like these two translations is that they remain gender neutral. Regardless of the sex of the sinner, the response is the same. There are three phases to this process. Here's how the New World Translation renders it. Moreover, if your brother commits a sin, go and reveal his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take along with you one or two more, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses every matter may be established. If he does not listen to them, speak to the congregation. If he does not listen even to the congregation, let him be to you just as a man of the nations and as a tax collector. Matthew 18, 15 to 17, New World Translation. Even the Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses admits that the first two steps can be handled by men or women. However, they claim that step three must be dealt with by three appointed older men. But it doesn't say that here, nor anywhere else in Scripture, for that matter. It says the congregation. Other versions render it as the assembly, or the church, which is the body of Christ. If the sinner does not listen after two efforts to bring him or her to repentance, then the entire church or congregation or the local assembly of the children of God are to sit down with the sinner in an effort to reason things out. This re would require that both men and women be present. We can see how loving this arrangement is. Take as an example a young man who has engaged in fornication. At stage 3 of Matthew 18, he will find himself facing the entire congregation, not only the men, but the women as well. He will receive counsel and exhortation from both the male and female perspective. How much easier it will be for him to fully understand the consequences of his conduct when he gets the viewpoint of both sexes. For the sister facing the same situation, how much more comfortable and secure she will feel if women are also present. Jehovah's Witnesses' reinterpretation of this direction from our Lord that changes the congregation into a committee of three men is just another example of them rewriting scripture to suit their theology that we've already seen them do by demoting Judge Deborah and appointing General Barak to her post. This is pure vanity, plain and simple. As Jesus puts it, it is in vain that they keep worshiping me because they teach commands of men as doctrines. Matthew 15, 9. It is said that the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. 
The pudding that is the Jehovah's Witnesses judicial system has a very bitter taste and is poisonous. It has resulted in untold pain and hardship for thousands and thousands of individuals who have been abused, some to the point where they took their own lives. This is not a recipe designed by our loving Lord. There is, to be sure, another Lord who has designed this particular recipe. If Jehovah's Witnesses had obeyed Jesus' instructions and included women in the judicial process, particularly in step three, just imagine how much more loving the treatment of sinners within the congregation would have turned out to be. There is yet another example of men altering the Bible to fit their own theology and confirm the dominant role of men in the congregation. The word apostle comes from the Greek word apostolos, which according to Strong's Concordance means a messenger, one sent on a mission, an apostle, envoy, delegate, one commissioned by another to represent him in some way, especially a man sent out by Jesus Christ himself to teach the gospel. In Romans 16.7, Paul sends his greetings to Andronicus and Junia, who are outstanding among the apostles. Now, Junia in Greek is a woman's name. It is derived from the name of the pagan goddess Juno, to whom women prayed to help them during childbirth. The New World Translation, as well as other popular translations, substitutes Junius for Junia which is a made-up name not found anywhere in classical Greek literature. Junia, on the other hand, is common in such writings and always refers to a woman. Why do so many Bible translators make this change? It could be that male bias is at play. Male church leaders cannot stomach the idea of a female apostle. Yet, when we look at the meaning of the word objectively, is it not describing what we would today call a missionary? And do we not have female missionaries today? So what is the problem? We have evidence that women served as prophets in Israel. Besides Deborah, we have Miriam, Huldah, and Anna. We have also seen women acting as prophets in the Christian congregation during the first century. Joel predicted this. Inciting his prophecy, Peter said, and in the last days, God says, I will pour out some of my spirit on every sort of flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And even on my male slaves and on my female slaves, I will pour out some of my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Acts 2, 17 and 18. This turned out to be true. For instance, Philip had four daughters, all of whom were prophets. See Acts 21, 8 and 9. We have now seen evidence, both in Israelite and in Christian times, of women serving in a judicial capacity, acting as prophets, and now there is evidence pointing to a female apostle. Why should any of this cause a problem for the males in the Christian congregation? Perhaps it has to do with the tendency we have of trying to establish authoritative hierarchies within any human organization or arrangement. Perhaps men view these things as an encroachment on the authority of the male. The whole issue of leadership within the Christian congregation will be the subject of our next video. Thank you for your financial support and your many words of encouragement.